Okay, welcome to our last class in existentialism. Um, my last class as a teacher at the University of Utah, um, and maybe forever, hopefully not. I really hope not, but um, this one's a weighty one for me. So um, as I was just saying, this is our last lecture, looking off into the sunset, looking for my wonderful students and seeing an empty chair sitting next to me, or maybe it's me that's gone and you're still swinging, looking off in the sunset. Um, well, however you interpret the image, uh, do your work. So if you don't have an A yet, earn your A. Um, get good grades, ask for help, um, available to help however you need help. If you need help understanding how the system works, which hopefully not at this point. Um, if you need any assistance with uh, the easiest or best path to um, an A, I'm absolutely willing to help you game my own system to get a very, you know, like as expedient an A as you can. Now this is to like miss out on all of the educational opportunity of the class, but I understand that um, we're all making our own decisions as adults here. So um, if you need help and like your whole life will crumble if you don't pass the class, reach out and, and I will help you get across that finish line. Um, and yeah, don't forget to fill out your course evaluations. They're really important and um, I would be very grateful if you did. Uh, and I think they're open for like another week or so, something like that. So get that done and, and yeah, it takes five, 10 minutes. All right, so last week on existentialism with Spencer, we read the first half of uh, the ethics of ambiguity and we learned a whole lot of uh, de Beauvoirian uh, and Sartrean, I suppose, uh, jargon, like the disclosure of the self by the um, interaction of the in itself with the for itself, which is inspired by our inner subjective world, right? Where um, consciousness is sort of radically free and that it openly just like perceives things. And um, it's also able to be ethically free in that it can take a stance in how it perceives things. It's not just seeing the redness of a color, but judging that redness as beautiful or as ugly or whatever else, right? That the disclosure activity um, is a meaning making one, right? Um, and there's a sense of freedom, which is Sartre's, which um, understands that sort of passive sort of quality of being or condemned to be free as its own form of freedom. And Simone de Beauvoir says, that that's not enough for an ethics. We need to also understand this meaning making sort of freedom, the sort that has an intentional stance on the world as being um, a, the sort of freedom we should focus on when we're wondering how to um, ethically, morally interact with one another. That if this disclosure of self to oneself, of world to self, and of other to self, and self to other, I suppose, um, the relation is symmetric, so it goes both ways. Um, we need to be focusing on uh, how we use that kind of ethical freedom, as she calls it, uh, and the responsible sort of use of that ethical freedom, um, which uh, I just described in that slide. We also saw a bunch of ways that this process um, can become uh, corrupt in which it's mistaken, right? We had the child and the serious person and the sub man. You remember the, the like sub man, um, the adventurer, the passionate. Um, these are people who get, well, in some cases, some of it right, right? Like one little tiny part of the picture that makes an ethical person a free person, a um, responsibly self disclosing, meaning making person in some of the Bavar's world. Um, and then sort of eschews the rest of the, the project. This child gets the spontaneity bit right, but then um, doesn't actually see themselves as having uh, uh, like control or uh, that they don't see themselves as having the, the sort of power that um, is required to shift the world into to what they hope it becomes. Um, the, the serious man is, um, uh, it does recognize their power, but then they don't have the spontaneity. They don't see that um, there is uh, an ability to meaning make in a way that turns out good rather than just um, like cynically resigned nothingness. Yeah, Will? Is it meant to be like hierarchic 
cool or did that was that just the way I interpreted it? Yeah, well, so I maybe kind of I mean that's it there, yeah, there, there's a kind of like in her presentation, there might like be child, a, submit, serious man adventure, passionate. Yeah, and like you get closer and closer. That might be deliberate. Um, I haven't thought about that before. That's kind of I, I mean it makes sense given the presentation. Um she doesn't explicitly say it's hierarchical, which is why I'm sort of hesitating because I'm thinking that if it were hierarchical, then like you're you're like adding a layer every time, and like so maybe you start as a child and then you become a sub man and then you become serious. I don't think it's like linear like that. Um, I I don't want to sound douchey, but I think I've got it circled. That I think she says she does. Terrible. Okay, yeah, yeah. If you could pull it up, that'd be really interesting Probably to know. Yeah. Okay, well, maybe, maybe to show you after. yeah, maybe doing break after class. I'd be interesting, interested to know. Um, yeah, so if if it is hierarchical, then that would imply kind of like process of development, um, which I don't recall, but would be interesting to see developmental um, quality of the ethic of ambiguity. Um, but yeah. Uh, so there's the the subman who is like your Sicario murderer dude who like gets the freedom part but not the responsibility bit you know like just does whatever without care um, for anybody and then you have the adventurer who gets the responsibility but doesn't think about the effect of their actions on others right it's just about their adventure it's it, they they take for granted the world in which they adventure right so. Um, Taylor Swift adventures on 17 minute plane flights, not thinking about the fact that we're all using metal straws and you know saving our tears to salt our food so we're not mining you know, whatever, right? Um, and then you have the the passionate, which similar to the the adventurer has sort of like the childlike spontaneity, the um, understanding of the the resigned sort of seriousness of the world, but they're not like you know lost in the seriousness, um, and they are interested in each other. Now that I'm even describing this, it does sound kind of progressive, does it like developmental, right? You're getting a little bit better every time. Because what the, the passionate share, so like Tristan, Tristan and Isolde was the example, um, is that they're adventuring, but like they love each other. And so their adventuring requires the commitment to another person. Um, whereas someone of ours says, this is pretty close, but not quite, because we need to not just be committed to one other person. Um, or the thruple of people that we're interested in, but rather um, we need to be committed to like humanity, right? People in general. And so the, the ethics of ambiguity ought to um, have us will for the sake of freedom in a non-empty way that uh, meaning makes in the world for the sake of that like freedom, uh, uh, like the scope continued existence of freedom that is like unlimited or as unlimited as it can be um and is like important and social um and that's because being is not only our own it's shared right we're all like participants in the process of being um and to will oneself free is also to will others free, which is not an abstract formula, she says. It points out to each person concrete action to be achieved. So the question then becomes is like what this concrete action is and how it's supposed to work, right? So um, the, the, the will to freedom in pointing out concrete actions also points out the problems that arise when we try to act at all in the world, right? That there's what she calls the antinomies of action, um, that uh, no ruler is innocent. I think we hit that quote later, but um, yeah. So, so that the project in the second half of the book is to give some examples of how the, the use of ethical freedom um, can be responsible. And she doesn't really ultimately end up giving us a fully complete moral system in the same sort of way that Bentham and Mill did in their works and Kant does poorly in the groundwork for the metaphysics of morals um, or Aristotle in the Nic Nicomachean ethics. Um, but she does get us pretty close, at least I, I thought. Um, 
So before we move on to the positive aspects of ambiguity, which is like sort of the overview of this section of the book, what did you guys think of the second half? So now we've finished it. You have different impressions than uh, last week or new insights or nothing at all? Yeah, sure. I'm excited to see how, like, maybe I missed how the defense is. But I remember, I think it was in Sartre's Existentials and Humanism. He says that, like, uh, there, there are atheists that destroy Christianity and then reinstill Christian ethics into society, then say that it's like their own, but basically Christian ethics. And I thought Simone and David Bois kind of did the same thing at the end here, which is the like love everybody for themselves uh, and, and um, like love all men mm -hmm. kind of thing. Uh, but it doesn't seem. I missed the like hard argument for why that should happen. Um, and so it seems she just kind of like a, did the Christian thing where she can still Christian ethics without calling it Christian. Yeah, so I think there's an interesting objection here. So the, the last part of today's lecture that I have prepared discusses the two forms of free or future that she um, espouses, discusses, um, where one sort of future is uh, like utopia, uh, end of history, heaven, nirvana, whatever. Um, and the other is like the present real world that we're all committed to, the one that comes from like where we are right now. Um, and you might think that the difference, or she might think in fact, that the, the difference between her like moralizing ethical freedom um, is that it, it remains in the real future and not this like utopic one. Um, but it sounds like you're bringing up an objection, which um, is interesting that like the, the process of doing an ethics at all, um, requires presupposes has a as a necessary precondition um a form of future that is like the good future um towards which we aim our our intents and actions and uh even if we say that it's not utopic like we must presuppose something of that sort in doing an ethics at all which is i think a cool objection um so i suppose maybe put a pin in it and see like what happens when it comes up um because it's it's an interesting thought yeah other impressions of the end of the ethics of ambiguity is anybody else irritated that they didn't capitalize any of the words on this front page is that just me and also no, like like yeah. all right rachel and i everybody else all right well i suppose i'm just Waiting to capital letters, huh? Um, how about online? Do you guys have thoughts about the ethics of ambiguity relative to our other readings? Incomplete. Jason. I still haven't finished it. Hopefully I will, but my feeling is <laughs> Me <so> too. <laughs> kind of that I I feel like her arguments are often not fully formed and she sort of sets the groundwork for it and then just like jumps ahead to the conclusion she wants. Mm -hmm. But I can never quite tell if it's just me being dumb or if that's what's actually happening. But I get that feeling repeatedly throughout reading this. It's like, I, I don't know if I'm missing something, but the argument doesn't seem to be there. She just kind of sets the groundwork and then all of a sudden you're at the conclusion. Yeah, so I, I got a bit of this sense too, um, especially with the end because she's giving a bunch of examples rather than like drawing very clear inferences and the examples are supposed to motivate us. Um, and I'm not sure if it like really works well that way, but I mean, at the end of the day, she's just trying to like convince us that a project like this is the right kind of project, not that she's built the structure of the project, I think. that At least that's the way I read it and doesn't end me up in that issue exactly, but you know, that might just be my consummate positivity and charitability with respect to these readings and, and like it could just be that there's something like definitely missing here yeah and it's probably more the first half that i have that trouble with i think as she develops after the first half is less of an issue sure i think I don't know. i'm actually curious not abstraction because a lot of like you know uh a lot of the things we've read so far have been like 
you know, creating examples or fiction. And she goes, this is like, you know, political parties and realities and organizations and societal structures we've created are built around X idea. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that was really, uh, you know, that helped me kind of understand a bit better what she was saying. I'm like, okay, right. Yes. I know, I know history to some degree. Yeah. And, and that's, that's a, a nice feature of this too, is that, um, where Camus is maybe like overindulgent in his reference of artists and writers and stuff of his day, philosophers, in a way that like, I remember when I asked this question about the myth of Sisyphus, many of you felt sort of like the reading made you feel stupid, right? Um, like, oh no, I don't, I don't know any of this stuff, right? The Beauvoir does something similar, like in referencing political events of the time and like these political parties and these political commentators and like actual events from her, like that everybody would have known uh, reading this. Uh, but I, I never, I mean, I, you know, I, I don't want to impose this feeling on you. I didn't get that similar sort of sense that like I had to be on the in group to kind of get it, you know, it felt at least inviting, even if it is dense. Um, and the examples, and that like, you know, in that sense are still useful, even though they're not our history anymore. Um, it's her history, it's her, her political world that we don't exist in anymore, but it still like felt like there was some grip there. So yeah. I don't think this adds anything, but I read the first 30 pages like three times and she's just got bangers. Yeah. Like, <laughs> damn, just so yeah. many quotable, yeah. right? So I haven't gotten through it, but I think it's like you said, where it's like reading it or reading it, like reading it. And I think that's what kind of slowed me down Yeah, is I'd read like another thing and be like, wait, that implicates the other thing that I thought was this thing, but I'm wrong. And so yeah, I'm excited to read the rest of it, but. It might be the most intricately I've ever annotated a book. Yeah, yeah. And then just so many things that you could totally get like a cheesy tattoo of. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, if uh, if there's any value in reading a work of philosophy, it's to inspire cheesy tattoos. <laughs> yeah. I have a few of them already. So. Well, good. So, um, sorry? Is that where Dustin got all his things from? <laughs> yeah, perhaps. Um, yeah, Pierce? Yeah, I was just well, was interested about like this reading, especially now that I got through the second half. Um, I don't mean the same. But hers was dense in the sense that I, I felt like it was more enlightened in a way. Like, but like her argument felt like better, like developed. Like it, she didn't like sort of fully get there. Like yeah, she was kind of like had that like pushing ethics at the end. But it felt more developed than like Camus in a way or like Sartre. Like I didn't understand part of it, and I kept reading it. But I felt like that was a little that it was just like out there it was more that it was just a really dense piece of writing yeah in a sense like it was just like a lot of substance it was kind of just... which is also why i signed this last I, I so camus is my favorite existentialist but i think the war is the best um and this work is um the natural development of sartre and camus into something that could have been what existentialism should have turned into should it have like survived right um and it didn't it 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 died on the vine um at least as its own individual school of thought its themes exist all over the place still but um but yeah it, it, it my choice of this book is last in part is for that reason is that she's not out there um, and you, you have to know Camus and Sartre to see like where the development goes. Um, and this is where it should go. And it's like, this is almost this book, I, I read it as like a call to arms, right? Like, let's get moving forward from this point. Um, so um, yeah, let, let's see what that point ends up being where we're like supposed to move on from. So her goal for the rest of the book is to explain how it's possible to will freedom for its own sake without that being like an empty principle, right? Um, and you can say easily enough, oh yeah, just will for the sake of freedom, but what does that mean? And with actual choices, when we're given actual problems, how do we will for the sake of freedom um, without obstructing freedom and, and like, you know, 
nobody knows exactly what's going to happen every time you do something, right? Um, and so when we're doing the guesswork of practical reasoning, um, how do we justify the risks that we take? Um, how do we justify the harms that get caused from uh, the failure to do um, the, the best of all possible actions, even if like that was our intention, you know, best laid plans off go awry, right? Um, she'll also critique tyrants and political movements, political parties really, um, that betray the core existentialist program, which I think pretty much amounts to all political parties. Um, so political parties are not very good, um, but they have some things right. Um, we'll also redefine ambiguity in opposition to the absurd. So ambiguity is, is not what um, we sort of may have thought it was at the beginning of the book, uh, the, the de Beauvoir version of Sartre and Camus absurd, but um, it really becomes something epistemic uh, in the second half as she contrasts her concept with the absurd. Um, and she's gonna hopefully inspire ethical acts of freedom um, by asking what the positive aspects of ambiguity are, how can we like turn a positive project out from our consideration of the kind of freedom that we have and the activity of like disclosure of being and the sort of thing, like living in the world, right? Um, and the first positive aspect that she discusses is the aesthetic attitude. So as she says, thus, every man has to do with other men. The world in which he engages himself is a human world in which each object is penetrated with human meanings. It is a speaking world from which solicitations and appeals rise up. This means that through this world, each individual can give his freedom a concrete content. He must disclose the world with the purpose of further disclosure and at the same movement, try to free men by means of whom the world takes on meaning. We may call this attitude aesthetic because the one who adopts it claims to have no other relation with the world than that of the detached, than that of detached contemplation. Outside of time and far from men, he faces history, which he thinks he does not belong to like a pure beholding. This impersonal version equalizes all situations. It apprehends them only in the indifference of their differences. It excludes any preference. So the aesthetic attitude is supposed to be this. I read this as something similar to Camus' like lucid awareness of the absurd, something similar to um, Kierkegaard's Night of Infinite Resignation, right? That is this quality of how we approach the world. Um, and one is not like nihilistically or cynically resigned to, to the world and it's evil and just like it's facticity as de Beauvoir would call it, um, nor are we to be consumed by its absurdity per Camus, right? Um, the aesthetic attitude is something it, it's a it's almost stoic, I think, but similar in that like you see the world in this detached way. You see the world as um, uh, having one oneself having no relation with it um, and uh, approaching it from a place of detached contemplation. Um, and what this affords you is the ability to um, disclose the world in a way consistent with like constant, uh, meaning making for the sake of freedom that isn't like biased um, towards you know your interests or the interests of your party or of your family or your close people or whatever the detached attitude is important and the detached attitude is like one of I don't know intellectual achievement you see the the ambiguity in front of you and so you just you can't know anything you become skeptic in, in the appropriate sorts of ways and from this skeptical attitude we approach the world um, in this aesthetic way that's going to enable the, the ethics to work out, says the Beauvoir. So um, it's a first step towards the ethics that she's trying to, to create. Um, and the aesthetic attitude is also creative. So it involves not just the disclosure of the world um, by the ways we interact with it. It also uh, is... Uh, as I described at the beginning of the lecture, it's, it's intentional, right? That you can disclose a beautiful world. And insofar as you do so, you make the world actually beautiful in that way. When we um, uh, are in a bad mood, 
and you go shopping and you get irritated with the cashier for no fault of their own because you're in a bad mood like you know you're making their day worse because of you know your energy's off or whatever um same idea right that uh the way that we approach the world and interpret it affects how other people feel and interpret their worlds as well and there's this detached contemplative aesthetic attitude that gives us the ability to disclose the worlds to our you know fellow mm -hmm. cashiers or whatever um, in a way that is respectful of, of their freedom, that isn't biased towards, you know, how we might feel or whether we woke up on the right or the wrong side of the bed, that sort of thing, but that is just sort of constantly seeking the, the disclosure of a world with the maximum of freedom. Um, and it's able to do this because it's indifferent to absurdity, ambiguity, despair, abandonment. Um, it recognizes all of these things. In fact, that's how it's able to be indifferent, but um, it is indifferent to them nonetheless. Um, okay, so freedom and liberation. So as she says, one of the chief objections to the will to freedom is that it is only a hollow formula and offers no concrete content for action. Disclosing being and willing freedom for devoir are the same thing. So, like, if you say, like, just will freedom, okay, well, do I get the um, veggie or the pastrami? What, what, what does that do for me in terms of actual choice? Um, this is an empty proposition. But if it turns out that to will freedom is to disclose being and disclosing being is something that we're like passively involved with all the time and can become actively involved with by um, disclosing the right kind of world, making it appear meaningful in the ways that um, are good, then it the, the willing of freedom is something active and sort of always around. It's universal in, in um, our interaction with the world. So insofar as we act, we disclose the possibilities of being to others. Look, I can be this way, you can be that way. I see what it's like for you to be a human in that respect, and you see me, and we find a middle ground um, between our disclosure, our co-disclosure of the world, um, and that's how we like live socially together. Um, okay, so an aesthetic attitude plus a will to freedom gives us the will to create for the sake of disclosing being. How can we continue to see more of the world, more of the possibility of the world uh, without cutting off possibility from the world, without cutting off the capacity to disclose and make the world meaningful? Uh, and if we approach this problem uh, well, then um, we inspire other people to do the same, right? We like will other people's ability to continue like realizing their worlds for themselves and they'll do the same for us. Um, but it turns out that freedom constrains itself. Insofar as science demands the truth, we have rampant confirmation bias throughout the sciences. Insofar as art establishes idols, everybody loves Van Gogh and, uh, you know, forgets about your local neighborhood artist, right? Um, that everybody takes the interstate instead of the state highways where, like, the real people live, Um and when the politician operates from the mandate of heaven, right, God told me to do this, or uh, the mandate of history, right, that the end of history is this dialectical project, this utopic ideal that we're all striving for, um, we lose sense of, like, the reality on the ground of, like, our interaction with the world. We um, put our heads in the clouds. Uh, we um, constrain ourselves. So if, if freedom is used to seek some abstract... Um, uh, or is fixed by some abstract. So it's like if, if you're seeking some goal that will never be, um, or if you are uh, acting for the sake of some goal that will never be, um, we make mistakes. But it turns out that being is too thoroughly ambiguous um, in, to have such goals, so, such like I, conceptions of the way a perfect world should be and would turn out, that we can't know like how things will go and we can't know um, every consequence of our actions, right? That like if everything we do is truly kind of a butterfly effect, we might be able to see a few steps ahead, right? Um, but do we see thousands of years into the future how our rippled actions now might um, uh, coalesce together to create big waves of the, we don't see any of that, right? We have too limited a perspective. 
And so de Beauvoir says like, let's forget all of this romanticism and idealism uh, in uh, our moral normative thinking, how we ought to act in the world uh, and get real, right? And the way we do this is through the aesthetic attitude. Um, to will for the sake of um, these abstract ideals is to will in bad faith. So as she says on tyranny and, and oppression, which um, justify themselves in this sort of way, right? They justify themselves as uh, like, oh yeah, I, I see I'm not so great, but it's really for the greater good, right? Um, on these sorts of um, people and, and uh, actions, she says, we have to respect freedom only when it is intended for freedom, not when it strays, flees itself and resigns itself. A freedom which is interested only in denying freedom must itself be denied. And it is not true that the recognition of the freedom of others limits my own freedom. To be free is not to have the power to do anything you like. It's not the Karamazov claim that everything is permissible because um, then you don't get any ethics, right? She's contradicting the Dostoevsky lesson. Rather, de Beauvoir says, it is to be able to surpass the given toward an open future. The existence of others as a freedom defines my situation and is even the condition of my own freedom. Does anybody want to try to interpret this um, paragraph with respect to oppression and tyranny? What does she mean when she says the existence of others as a freedom defines my own situation and is even the condition of my own freedom? Yeah. I think of it like um, positive liberty. So I like negative liberty being some force saying, oh, you can't do X and Y thing. We're going to prohibit that. But positive liberty being like, you need to have certain things in order to have the most liberated life, like housing, food, things like that. And so once you impinge on another, it's kind of like the do no harm principle. Like once you impinge on another person's, that's not really freedom anymore. And that's maybe where yours ends. But also that means that your freedom is relative to other people around you. Yeah, right. So, you know, it, in a uh, small village where there's uh, 10,000 calories of food available per day, uh, you can feed a couple of uh, very gluttonous people or you can feed, you know, 10, a reasonable amount of calories. Um, and uh, if just a couple gluttons get fed, then everybody else starves, right? And so their freedom to eat as much as they like impinges upon other people's liberty, right? So your, your freedom, your ability to choose um, is conditioned upon other people's freedom as well. So like, for instance, um, if we all wanna like spread the calories around evenly so that we can all like not starve to death, um, then, you know, we might be a little hungry, but at least we're all like able to continue the, the uh, necessary jobs of the village, as opposed to just feeding the gluttons a few times until the rest of the village starves and dies. And then you have two people in the place of 10 needing to do a village's amount of work. And so then they fail and eventually the village dies out as well. So even when we take advantage of other people's um, resources and free capacities, uh, we limit the total system's ability to like continue functioning and working. And this causes uh, a limitation of our own freedom. So even like the tyrants and the oppressors themselves, insofar as they glut themselves on the power of others, the 10,000 strong who, you know, give bread to the millions as in the, the Grand Inquisitor, mm -hmm. um, even they eventually will have that um, uh, glut of, uh, free capacity, the, the positive liberty in excess um, will come back to bite him in the ass, right? Um, but even for the, the system that does work well, the, the amount of calories that you have is conditioned upon the amount of people that you have relative to the resources that there are. And so, yeah, what we're able to do depends on what others are able to do as well. And what the Bavar wants is for us to recognize this and then will a system that discloses a world in which there aren't a couple of gluttonous people, but enough people who are fed and doing well that they can like get along, right? And move forward and maybe like raise more chickens so that you know, everybody can have some eggs in the morning or something, you know, whatever. 
Um, okay, so the tyrant and the oppressor who wills only for their own freedom does so at the cost of others. Um, and insofar as they do so, they objectify those others, right? They say this person is not a person, but a resource whom I can farm for my own sake. Um, this person, the tyrant, is not to be respected. But the oppressor comes to us with all sorts of excuses which justify their will to limit freedom in bad faith, right? Um, the oppressed doesn't deserve it, right? Oh, they're not people. Um, they're not fully human. Or uh, look, I picked myself up by my own dang bootstraps and look at you on welfare and all that, right? Um, they want to be oppressed. Look, you're just lazy and you just want to be lazy. And I'm the one doing all the hard work, so I should get all the resources, right? Look at you just wanting to be lazy and do nothing. Um, or uh, a more just version is, look, um, I know you have to suffer a little bit now, but it's for the greater good. And your sacrifice is very much appreciated. We're very grateful. Thank you for your sacrifice, right? Um, these are the excuses that the oppressors and the tyrants of the world give to justify their gluttonous excess of free choice at the cost of others' capacity to like freely disclose for themselves in a way that like is dignified and good for them, right? Um, that these are all the excuses that are given um, to will in the way that you want to will that comes at the cost of other people being able to do the same. And she says, if these are the excuses that are given, we just like shouldn't even listen because people are tyrants and oppressors. Um, these arguments all aim to justify the act of limiting freedom and along with it to limit being and its disclosure and its meaning making capacity. So the oppressor, however, is at least correct in revealing the difficulty of willing freedom without limitation, right? That when we say your sacrifice is uh, very much appreciated, I got to see uh, the earth from space. Thank you for all of your dollars, right? Um, that this attitude, even though it's absurd, right? Um, still highlights the fact that uh, in any choice, there is responsibility and consequence, right? that it, for any choice to consume any calories in this village metaphor situation that I've set up, um, to, to, to be a perfect altruist might mean starving yourself, right? Giving everybody else those resources. But um, to choose to like take part in the system means reducing the potential calories for everybody else. And so that like comes at a cost, right? The oppressor is just like acting in bad faith insofar as they're gluttonously beyond the um, the, the, uh, any reasonable standard of, um, interaction for the sake of freedom, but th th that is sort of universal and not just selfish. Right? Um, so to act in one way is to constrain action in another. And this is what, uh, de Beauvoir calls the antinomies of action. Okay. So she says, this is one of those bangers. No action can be generated for man without, no action can be generated for man without it immediately without its being immediately being blah. no action can be generated for man without its immediately being generated against men no one governs innocently so we have a cause and a cost right so we defeat the nazis but it costs the generation of young men who died in the field of battle um we use renewable energy but this destroys impoverished mining communities who have no other recourse but uh the copper and coal mines of their hometowns, right? They, they'll just all starve out and die, you know, become Walmart greeters. Um, and that's that. Um, you pass a just law, but this constrains natural freedom. You pull a lever to save five lives and you condemn one person to death, which is just to say that a single person's life is incalculably, incalculably valuable. Wow, that's hard to say. And it is for this reason that sacrifice gets its meaning, that a sacrifice is made because lives have dignity, because they matter, right? And so if you go to war to, you know, defeat the, the Nazis, um, uh, then you're doing so 
knowing the cost of these uh, invaluable lives with their inviolable dignity, and you're violating it, and you're sent, you're choosing to to pay that price, right? What did Truman say after he dropped the bomb? That uh, I saved. Uh, I, I would I would do it again because I saved a hundred thousand of our boys' lives at the cost of theirs, and that's the choice I would make, right? Um, very, yeah. 50s president sort of vibe um but yeah i mean like like that's the calculation he says look i value our boys our american boys more than you know your couple of cities of innocent civilians um and so that's the calculation that i made um and so my action i know it was terrible but i calculated and thought that this was the better way of, of going about things and you know whether or not we land on truman's side or not um that this expresses again the antinomies of action that every action we choose comes at, at a cost of um uh, other world disclosing capacity so what justifies any action in the face of this antinomy right how do we like move forward how can we will freedom in this universal way that says like look i want to do what's good for everybody in the way that like allows you to maximally disclose being and me to maximally disclose being as well sort of holistically socially um what in actual fact when we're thinking about okay do i vote for bill a or do i abstain or do i vote against right these are very real practical decisions does bill a um do the will for the sake of freedom disclosure thing, right? Or does it not? Um, and I can see ways in which it does and ways in which it, does, it doesn't because of this antinomy thing. So how do we move forward, right? What justifies any action? And what David Barr tells us is that it has to do with the future, how we understand the future and the sort of future that we're striving for. So as she says, the word future, has two meanings corresponding to the two aspects of the ambiguous condition of man, which is the lack of being and which is existence. It alludes to both being and existence. When I envisage my future, I consider that movement which prolonging my existence of today will fulfill my present projects and will surpass them toward new ends. The future is the definite direction of a particular transcendence and it is so closely bound up with the present that it composes with it a single temporal form. But through, the centuries of, but through the centuries, men have dreamed of another future in which it might be granted them to retrieve themselves in glory, happiness, or justice, all capitalized. This future did not belong to the present. It came down upon the world like a cataclysm announced by signs which cut the continuity of time, by a messiah, by meteors, by the trumpets of the last judgment. This is the future which appears as both the infinite and as totality, as a number and as a unity of conciliation. It is the abolition of the negative. It is fullness, happiness. It is a future thing. Capitalized word, future thing, strange. However, those who project themselves towards a future thing, uh, which I think probably has to do with facticity, like the, the complete God unity of eminence in itself and of itself, future thing, um, and submerge their freedom in it, find the tranquility of the serious. Right. So what she's saying here is, look, there's two kinds of futures. There's the sort of future that is intimately connected to our present. It's the one that like, insofar as you come to lecture, you expect to like learn things, right? Hopefully. Um, that sort of future, which is real and connected to the world that we live in. And then there's the sort of future, which is associated with glory and happiness, justice, utopia, the last judgment, the world of the kingdom of heaven in which the beatific vision is realized and we all live unified with god right that there's that future too which nobody ever experiences it never happens we might strive for it it might be promised to us but that sort of future insofar as it fixes our judgments right with respect to the antinomy of action how do we like decide what to do um if we're focused on that future as being what determines how we act then we're not focused on the real world, right? We're focused on the real world as being not that thing, a lack of it. And that causes us to become something like the serious man that we learned about last week. It turns us serious. We see our actions as always failing. 
as not only failing in the sense that all actions will have ambiguous consequences that we must deal with, but that the ambiguity is infinitely thick, right? The absurd is, as Camus says, ubiquitous. It's everywhere. That there's no way through because we are not in that perfect world, that world in which eminence and facticity unify as in God, right? Uh, unless you're Spinoza or Barclay, it's just not the case, right? Um, and so the seriousness that follows causes a uh, mistaken form of practical reasoning with respect to the will to freedom. Okay, so future one and two, we just talked about these. Um, so she says, in this perspective, from the future two perspective, all moments are lost in the indistinctness of nothingness and being. Man ought not to entrust the care of his salvation to this uncertain and foreign future. It is up to him to assure it within his own existence. This existence is conceivable, as we have said, only as an affirmation of the future, but of, it, but of a human future, a finite future. So what she's saying is, look, all of you Puritan Calvinists, hellfire and brimstone people, stop worrying about, you know, like your, your day of judgment that comes when you die. We're living in the real world right now. So let's focus on making that the world that we want to turn into something better. Um, that the, the fact of your suffering now will be justified in the end on that final day when God's judgment shines a light upon our souls and realizes and, and we, we, see, we are seen in that true light as what we truly are. Well, you know, that day is not coming, right? Tomorrow is though, right? So let's work on how we can make that actual world that we're all a part of tomorrow a little bit brighter. So the antinomies of action, though, demand sacrifice. And the only justification for a sacrifice is a real finite human development and growth towards that achievable outcome, right? That a sacrifice is unjustified if the end never comes about, right? Why should we um, accept this world? Why should we accept this world even if it is the precursor to a perfect utopia, if that perfect utopia is always promised in the future. It's always one day ahead. There's this like limit approaching infinity, the asymptote, right? But we never touch the line, right? Then we return our ticket. Then we take the Ivan path. We say, screw this. I'm not a part of this game. I respect it. You know, I see the utopia in the future, but I'm not playing, right? I don't like these rules. I'm going to make my own game, a game that like helps people actually live today in this world. And the Beauvoir is telling us something similar, right? Saying, look, um, that future that never comes is not ours, uh, and no matter what we do, will involve contradiction with respect to the will to freedom, the antinomy of action. That there will, there must of necessity be a sacrifice uh, with respect to positive liberty, right? From the consequences of our actions, but what can justify those consequences? What justifies the suffering of that single lonely child screaming in the dark for their parents and dear kind God? Well, not the heaven that comes, especially if it's built on the back of this hill, but maybe like a nice hospital to take care of that kid, you know, maybe a warm blanket, right? Um, that kind of world would justify the sacrifice, right? The, the sort of world that inspires people to not have those children screaming out to dear kind God any longer. So the idea of utility as this ultimate normative fixing concept, right? Do whatever gives you the most utility um, or uh, teleology act for the sake of um, human happiness is the end at which all human acts aim uh, or historically speaking, that there will be an end of history, this like perfect dialectical material world that is some sort of decentralized um, utopic anarchy. Um, rapture, eudaimonia, nirvana, duty, all of these concepts sort of lose their grip. They become empty um, insofar as there is not that perfect world of the kingdom of ends as Kant envisioned or um, the uh, the greater good, right? The greatest good is something that is sort of predicated upon an idea of there being a greater good. If that greatest good is never around, then what good is all of this calculating for utility doing us anyways? And so we return to ambiguity, 
right? Because we still have these antinomies, right? Now we fo we're focusing on the right sort of future, right? We're focusing on the future of humans, of this world, that even if God exists and that utopic ideal is coming, it's not coming for us here, right? And so we got to focus on what we're doing for us here or else we'll have in World War III again, and that's no good, right? We just saw World War II and that's why all of the existentialists are so sad and abandoned anyways, right? Um, why we're worried about this stuff at all is because we don't want the world to be destroyed even more or again, ever again. So our path forward, even if we're focusing on the right sort of future, this world still remains ambiguous. What can we do, right? How do we overcome the infinities? If we reject the idea of a future myth, in order to retain only that of a living and finite future, one which delimits transitory forms. We have not removed the antinomy of action. The present sacrifices and failures no longer seem compensated for in any point of time. Thus, we are not ending by condemning action as criminal and absurd, though at the same time condemning man to action, right? So are we not saying like everything we do is we're, all, we're always guilty, right? Um, but you always must be, and so we're all just guilty, right? Are we not condemning man to just that? Which sounds just about where Camus stops. Right? Camus says, look, the world is absurd and everything that we do is gonna be equally absurd. And so may as well rebel against it as much as we possibly can, avoid philosophical suicide in light of this absurdity um, and just act, just rebel, ethic of quantity, right? But this isn't good enough for de Beauvoir. For de Beauvoir, the ethic of quantity is no ethic at all because the ethic of quantity might turn into some kind of tyrant, oppressor, utility monster, right? Um, and that's not good enough. Uh, and there's a reason she doesn't think it's good enough as well. It's not just like morally speaking, normatively speaking, like it would feel better if it weren't so bad. No, she thinks that the absurd that follows from the antinomies of action is not infinitely thick, that it can be dispelled, that we can do better in some cases and worse in others. Uh, so it's similar to Nietzsche, how we are able to transfigure the world and, and like say yes to life and do this world affirming, life affirming uh, uh, evaluation where you say, yeah, I would will it all again, right? You, you reinterpret the world under a single value. There are better and worse values, right? The better the value, the more uh, forward from this portal moment, right? And backwards that uh, reinterpretation and life affirmation is able to go, the more all encompassing it is. So similar with de Beauvoir, right? The the project of an ethics is going to be a, a is going to be better and worse uh, with respect to willing freedom. It's not just that uh, the absurd is infinitely thick, and so there is no such thing as better and worse, and quantity is all that there, all that's left over. No, she really does think that ambiguity can be dispelled. So the notion of ambiguity, therefore, must not be con confused with that of absurdity. Where absurdity precludes the possibility of meaning at all, ambiguity rather precludes the ultimate unification of meaning, um, but not meaning making. So the, the unification of meaning with object, imminence and facticity, right? There's no ultimate unification because that would just be God, right? This perfect being. Rather, we can get closer and closer. We can bring our world disclosing activity of being and the meaning that is the derivative product on the other end of that activity of being into closer union with one another. And the ethic of ambiguity is an ethics, a, a form of reasoning that is normative, that normatively drives for this unification of those two things. Again, um, not saying that they ever can be unified because there will always be ambiguity in insofar as like we're human, right? Um, but we do better for ourselves when we get closer and closer. And so ambiguity, unlike the absurd, can be clarified. And an ethics of ambiguity aims at doing so without the need for some a priori future myth that justifies uh, acting for the sake of some esoteric principle, right? Um, all justifications are finite, and so they too will remain ambiguous. So an ethics of ambiguity that ends us where we begin, that, that, it, it, in ambiguity, that um, we're striving for something, we're never getting quite there, but it seems like things might get better if we strive in that kind of way. Um, 
we, we start from this principal place of uh, our activity being being ambiguous and then deriving some form of like practical reasoning, normative moral development off the back of this that then recognizes that it's always gonna, that our activities are always going to remain ambiguous even if we can like, you know, blow away some of the fog here and there. So have we come full circle for nothing, right? Are we just like back where we started? Like what good does this really do us if, even if we're blowing away some of the fog of ambiguity, if it's you know, it turtles all the way down with respect to ambiguity, then like, do we really have a moral system that can justify action and help us to like choose in the case of antinomy um, what to do or what not to do? What are we supposed to learn from this ethics? So Stibibor says, it will be said that these considerations remain quite abstract, right? She hasn't given us like uh, the rule book. She's given us something more along the lines of uh, heuristics for how a rule book should be written, right? And so the considerations remain quite abstract. What must be done practically? Which action is good? Which is bad? To ask such a question is to fall into naive abstraction. We don't ask the physicist which hypotheses are true, nor the artist, by what procedures does one produce a work whose beauty is guaranteed. That's Kant's job and does an interesting job when he failed. Ethics does not furnish recipes any more than do science and art. One can merely propose methods. And so I think this is a really cool aside. When we're doing ethics, if you write down the rule book, right, you like say this is good and this is bad, then you crystallize and you fix the future, right? You, you like determine some absolute moral law from a situation of being that is ultimately ambiguous, and then you're acting in bad faith, right? Because you know that your situation is ambiguous, but you've determined this kind of action is moral law. And so the only kind of ethics that we can do in good faith, authentically, is one that pays respect to the ultimate ambiguity or absurdity of our condition. And so only offers methods that every person will still need to decide for themselves how best to be and what turns out to be good and what turns out to be bad. And we're responsible for that right? in this Sartrean way. Um, we, we bear the responsibility for the consequences that follow the antinomy of action, even if we're willing for the sake of freedom, we bear the responsibility for the consequences. But if we do so in good faith, then at least um, if we're not always given the answer, the method of am I aiming sort of in the right direction for the, the, the disclosure of universal freedom or whatever, um, then that guides us in the right direction, so says the Beauvoir. Okay, so what methods then have we learned? Well, one, existence is disclosed to us as, an, as ambiguous insofar as we exist and live. Two, we're ultimately free, ethically and naturally. And it is through the willing of freedom, ethical freedom, that we can dispel some of the ambiguity of our collective being. We can work well together and sort of figure out ways that it does work. Uh, three, freedom is a value to be willed as communal, and so rejects the oppressor and tyrant who hoards. Um, I spelled hoard there. I spelled it like World of Warcraft hoard, not like smog hoards, gold hoard. Um, four, all actions come at a cost, the antinomies, right? And so there's no a priori justification for anything. He's like in the moment, you got to make the choice. Right? Um, and so to justify action, we must look only to the future that is human and real and achievable by the ends of our projects and not some you know, mythological end of history sort of thing. Um, and finally, if we act in this way, we do what we must come what may. This is the final line of the, the book. Um, and thus we are able to act authentically. So the, the do what we must come what may is the only response, the, the human response to the ethical methods given by de Beauvoir in light of antinomy and uh, ambiguity, right? We do what we must because we must act. We must be in the world. We must disclose the world. We must meaning make. But we do so with good intent, with good purpose, with the purpose of maximizing this, like, freedom, that, that the expression of ethical freedom and this disclosure activity, just like being at all. We want to maximize that. But we recognize as well that uh, the best laid plans, right, off go awry. Um, and so come what may, 
we do what we must come on name is um, de Beauvoir's uh, analog to, to Camus, you know, one must imagine says was happy, right? So she says, regardless of the staggering dimensions of the world about us, the density of our ignorance, the risks of catastrophes to come, and our individual weaknesses within the immense collectivity. The fact remains that we are absolutely free today if we choose to will our existence in its finiteness, a finiteness which is open upon the infinite. There is a very old saying, do what you must come what may. That amounts to saying in a different way that the result is not external to the goodwill which fulfills itself in aiming at it. If it came to be that each man did what he must, existence would be saved in each one without there being any need of dreaming of a paradise where all would be reconciled in death. Right? Focus on today's world. Right? Do good for each other and not for the sake of um, some abstract principle, but like for real human lives and real human values. Okay, so we'll do a group activity, put us together into small groups because we have time for it. Um, and there's two halves to this. So for those of you watching in the future, um, answer this question, right? What have you learned from this class or how will it affect your thinking in the world? What is the practical upshot of existentialism for you? Like apply what you've absorbed this summer to your life and like try and come up with like a motto or something, right? Like one sentence, okay? And if you email me this one sentence, uh, I'll give you five points because I'm curious. I, I, I'd like to know um, if there's an upshot for you, uh, you know, like good or bad with respect to existentialism, but what is that upshot? Um, okay, and then for like our in-class group activity, I'm going to pause the recording. We'll come right back and get the discussion. So let's start with online. What, did you come up with any one-liners, any takeaways? What, what was our, uh, what, what did we learn this summer? So we, we all kind of agreed that um, the the bulk of the readings were uh, pretty difficult and a lot of it went over our heads. Um, but um, particularly with De Beauvoir, there were um, little little bangers mixed in there, little one liners that that stuck with all of us. Um, but the sentence we kind of came up with was, although uh, my group and I found the readings were um challenging uh we find that uh freedom and purpose can be found somewhere in between rational goal making um and pursuit and the irrationality of existence that's nice yeah so so like i was saying earlier before class i don't know if i had the recording going but existentialism is the sort of it's a kind of philosophy that you have to read all of it to understand any of it. And so now you've read all of the big giant core chunk of it. So like, hopefully you have the skills to now like approach any other existentialist like subject um, in an informed way that you'll be able to pick out the themes of uh, freedom or of abandonment and of suffering and overcoming it, right? That um, is present all over in, in philosophy and in literature and in film and, and elsewhere, right? Um, and if you're very excited about uh, the rational pursuit of uh, the meaning-making activity that may itself as well be mildly irrational as in to like read more Sartre and Heidegger than, um, and Nietzsche, then like hopefully there are some skills now to um, to do that successfully. So good. Yeah. How about in person? Any one-liners or takeaways worth sharing? Embrace the suck. Embrace the suck. <laughs> All right. Yeah, that is a one-liner. All right. So embrace the suck. Uh, develop the thought. Uh, life is... Um, absurd or ambiguous either way it still works um and if you turn away from it i think most of our readings have agreed that you're like doing something bad and so you have to confront it um and that is the embracing uh, of the suck which is you have to and then i think Camus said it really good which is like you don't even have a choice once you've seen the absurd it's like really hard to 
time that doesn't exist, you know you're committing philosophical suicide when you do it. Yeah. And so you have to embrace it or you go insane. Yeah, and I like the metaphor of, of embracing too because it involves a kind of, I don't know, intimacy, love maybe, right? That the, the suck is what it is to be, right? Um, and there is a way to be indifferently, lucidly, uh, aesthetically aware of it um, and make value from it, right? To find um, meaning in it, through it, uh, by our activity of being with it. An embrace is not a, like, look at this suck, embrace the suck, it is, right? It's, um, is to, like, accept it, right? Uh, and And yeah, hopefully... Um, like everybody's life sucks a little bit, uh, and it, life seems to really suck the more we move forward into our dystopian future, strange new, brave new world. Um, and yeah, I, I think there's something to that kind of attitude that, um, not fearfully turning away from what sucks just to like you know hedonically satisfy yourself or you know like avoid the issue but to like be able to accept or to try to become able to accept um through embracing is um, an important skill in my estimation at least to embrace the suck what else we got yeah speaking just for myself and i don't know I'd already been thinking about this, so I'm not sure how much of it came from this class or somewhere else, but it certainly developed over the summer. But I'm really interested in just trying not to make value judgments about my experiences as they're happening and just try and understand the experience for what it is mm -hmm. um, and not see it as positive or negative. But I think almost like paradoxically by not making the initial value judgment, it seems like I can come to positively value experiences that would have otherwise certainly been negative but i have to like not make the value judgment for that to happen i don't know so it's like set my goal as not making any value judgments and then i still end up making them but they're like better than like okay. i'm more okay with these experiences that would have otherwise been full of suffering um so yeah i think that's like nietzsche was definitely the like my favorite and i think the ideas and the other readings we did a lot of my favorite ideas from those also have like an itchy and thread so yes yeah. yeah that was my favorite yeah it, and I mean, it sounds sort of like the aesthetic attitude right it's a yeah. from a place of indifference uh meaning disclosure occur meaningful disclosure occurs and the natural result tends to be something positive right because you're not fighting the current you're not yeah. like working your way upstream uh through a river that really wants you to go downstream right you're floating on top and finding that the currents as they pull you um you can still swim around right but you're not fighting them yeah i think aesthetic attitude is yeah i think that's right because I mean, what I've been trying to apply it to is like pain, like physical pain. There's been like two little tiny times this summer where I could, like my neck or my leg or something was really hurting, but for just like a really short amount of time, it's like I was able to just perceive the pain as just the sensation without any of the- Attachment. Of the suffering that is usually attached. And that was really interesting. And it was really like enjoying a nice painting or like a, a good piece of, I mean, that sounds silly, but it, that's kind of what it was like. It was like, oh, like it's interesting that it feels like that and blah, 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 and how it changes moment to moment. And yeah. Meditating on it? Kind of, yeah. No, I'm just I want to try that. Yeah, it's, it's interesting that the even like features to do with you, your facticity, as the Beauvoir would call it, right? Um, that you can almost utilize the ambiguity between eminence. In itself and for itself, the ambiguity between to uh, be detached from what would pull you down and reimagine, like redisclose um, as something that doesn't, right? So your your relationship to your like 
in itself relationship to a for itself facticity um, can shift. You can re-meaning make. If it's all ambiguous and absurd, then find the cleanest, clearest, smoothest path through the weeds, right? Yeah. Cool. What else we got? One-liners, takeaways? Yeah, Ashley? Oh, this is only a one-liner, but um, I think for me personally, I didn't discuss this at all. I just thought it was, this is just personally. Um, what scares me the most about, you know, the future and making my myself, um, or get, yeah, getting through it all in the world um, is things like, you know, applying for a job I don't want and um getting like an interview question of like what are your top five dream companies to work for and like my authentic answer would be fuck <laughs> <laughs> but um like so what I'm saying is I um I I, I before this class I had trouble with um understanding how to not um how to get through life without um committing like philosophical suicide you know um in order to do it because I do need a job um and what I've learned I think what's going to be really useful for me um I actually really like the authenticity um like acting in good faith thing and even if I can't always act in good faith, um, I can still hold my authenticity close to me, even when I can't act on it. Um, and I feel like that's going to keep me um, centered and grounded. Yeah, it's a do what you must come what may attitude to, to at least be aware of where the world forces you outside of um, like naturally authentic decision-making. That's a kind of antinomy, but it's something that you have to do, right? We have to like put food on the table, keep a roof over our heads, you know, not die of exposure very simply. Um, and that requires hard choice. But I think even in being aware, um, the, the sort of like, quality of absurdity, which leads to depression that sneaks up on you. And like, we don't even know, like I experienced this, right? Where I'll just be living in the world and then kind of like, oh shit, like something has gone terribly wrong for the last long period of time because I've been like in a groove and the groove got too deep and it, you know, like got so deep, the walls cave over me, that kind of thing. To, to maintain that lucid awareness is to enable a uh, do it must come what may, the kind of sternness that the existentialists were accused of, but which is also liberating in a sense in that, yeah, like we have to play a shitty game, um, but we know what our win conditions are. And, you know, even if some roles aren't so great, you know, they send us to jail or land us on the railroads when really we want the reds and the oranges. Um, monopoly right uh that you know we can still keep rolling right and know like what it is that we're hoping to create yeah it's good thanks for sharing anybody else yeah rachel i haven't fully formed this thought but before taking this class i felt pretty mentally unwell and now i feel fully unhinged <laughs> <laughs> but i feel decent about it because i feel like i've had a lot of these feelings and thoughts and then i was able to like see different iterations on things that i haven't had i hadn't had words for you know what i mean and also the like i don't know i have like a lot of i think i see my life sometimes in a very binaristic way and especially with uh, the Beauvoir kind of like settling into the ambiguity because it feels to me like kind of like you're saying with pain, like a lot of what like I'm feeling and thinking and all of these thoughts, it's like trying to sort them into this bifurcation, this duality, um, getting away from one, going towards the other when really you just kind of need to sit with it. And then that can be like the process of sitting with it 
and contemplating it is the product of making meaning out of your life. Mm -hmm. um, so now I'm just, yeah, just truly unhinged. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the, the first time I taught this class, I was really worried after teaching the myth of Sisyphus because a whole lot of like part of like I don't know, the vibe of that class, it was much closer to like the heart of the COVID pandemic as well was like suicidal ideation and stuff. And so the, the impact that even just like talking about suicide and the absurd can have on us is massive. And I think that feature is reflective of a need that we have, right? So like, as the Bois says, like it's the problems that it's evil that inspires the need for a system of good, right? It's the problem that inspires a solution. Um, similarly, the, the, that, the impact that thinking in this kind of way about these kinds of issues, e even if like the way that the issues were thought of in this continental early European obfuscated poetic or just very dense way is, is not so great. The issues themselves have an impact. Um, and, and that is a symptom of uh, our just like not thinking about this kind of stuff day to day, but it like, being around us all the time. It did like we have the blinders on, right? Um, and the the challenge that comes with the lucid awareness of absurdity and like how we cope with it. Now they, you can't unsee it, um, not without doing some other like repressive craziness, psychologically speaking. Um, and yeah, so, so hopefully this has been a safe place to, contend with challenging issues that deal with what it is to exist, to be, right? Not just, um, you know, what does it mean to be good or what, uh, what is it, what, what is a species or um, what, what is human nature, right? Like these abstract philosophical questions, like that is not the the content of the existentialist, the content of the existentialists is how do we cope with the activity that we are engaged with in every single moment of our living lives, right? Um, and, and yeah, hopefully it, it's, it's been, even if the result is unhinged, leads to um, some open doorways that, you know, go to the right place. <laughs> To continue the metaphor, yeah, fingers crossed, I suppose. Yeah. Um, what else? Yeah, Ruby. Uh, speaking personally, perhaps maybe a little too personally, uh, I think looking back, part of the reason I took this class was for like, I guess like a sort of negative catharsis in that like, I don't know. I, I I kind of wanted to hear that like the world sucks and it's garbage and stupid and that other people, like smart people, had to have the same thoughts. And like it, as self-destructive as that was, and I, I know it's stupid, but like I did, you know, I was in a bad spot. And coming into this class and having it be like, yes, things suck. That's assumed let's see what we, and all the readings are, you know, assume that, yes, okay, things are rough, let's move from there. That actually was more productive than any form of, like, just throwing myself relentlessly into negativity would have been. Just this sort of, like, yeah, it, it, it was, it was cathartic to see it established and then quickly tossed aside. And I think, I don't know, that just, like, that that helped me a lot, even even in a really small way. Good. I, I don't have a point here. I just I'm I'm glad that it has, and I hope it has for like everybody or you know most of us. It has for me. I mean, like I am really grateful to have had this teaching assignment because like you know I'm doing all the reading alongside you guys and like prepping to teach and stuff, and it, it's therapeutic for me to be in this class and like with you all thinking through these issues, like learning just alongside you guys. Um, and and it, it's, 
it's a goal of mine in choosing the readings that I do, not just to like tell a story and like build a thematic arc that, you know, completes where it has, um, but also in choosing different voices and the right sort of mix of existentialist voices. Um, because it, it's my impression that in, in teaching this class and in, in reading existentialists generally, that our relationship to existence, to like just being at all, um, is our own and it's kind of unique. And um, all of the existentialists, although they're like dealing with the same issue, deal with it in so, so many diverse ways, right? And so, so it's, I, I've made it a goal of the syllabus as well to like pick different voices that might hopefully like connect to different people in the class, like those of you. Um, and so not everybody's gonna like love Camus and not everybody's gonna love Kierkegaard, but so, you know, some people will love that voice or the other as well. And, and that um, that relationship, the, the like just seeing somebody doing it in a way that you can like be sympathetic with, that is like kind of like piercing through the absurdity, the, the suck, and then finding a way to embrace it with you know arms that look like your own. Um, I think it, I mean that, that's like my goal, right? Is to to at least have that be offered. Um, yeah, I'm glad to hear that it had a positive impact because it, it does on me as well. How about online? Anybody want to share? Yeah, I, I feel like um, personally, like this this class should be required. Um, <laughs> for like every major. Uh, I mean, like, despite the fact that I genuinely felt like I had the reading comprehension of a kindergartner and multiple times when reading these books, um, I, I think to push the idea that, you know, whether you're going into, you know, chemical engineering, architecture, business, whatever it is, to push the idea that life is not not a means to an end it's not it's not a there's not a day of salvation that will you know for you of all your problems and take away the suck um and to embrace the suck and to say that this is what life is uh i personally found a lot of peace and freedom in that concept alone um and i think de Beauvoir and camus in particular really pushed that with de Beauvoir saying how uh, every step towards the horizon we take, um, the horizon recedes a step. You know, it, there, that line that we're always chasing, it, you know, it's our human nature. Uh, I, like, I feel like that's how we evolved to be the creatures that we are today. So successful is like you put a human in a forest and they just start chopping down trees, like, aim, you know, and, and then building huts and, you know, putting a village together. It's always the next step and it's always, you know, a forward direction with our, I guess, material and objective goal setting and pursuit. Um, but there, there is no end. And to accept that and to accept that there's no day of salvation is, uh, it's in a way it's like binding, but also like incalculably uh, freeing and liberating. Um, so that, that was kind of my biggest takeaway. It's like, no matter what, career you're pursuing or, or you know goals you're pursuing I think everyone could benefit from these concepts yeah and it's such like a, an easy thing I, I experienced this in my own life right to like um fall into whether or not it's a trap I, I don't want to like make that judgment but at least to fall into the form of thinking that like what you're doing does have that sort of like ultimate end you know that you're build you're punching your Minecraft trees to turn into houses that become the village that becomes your utopia eventually, right? Um, you bring the kingdom of heaven on earth kind of thinking, right? Um, and, and again, to like speak personally to this, right? Like in my own process as a graduate student, like studying to do philosophy professionally forever, um, I find it really easy to think, okay, well, if I do this, then eventually I become the professor and then that's why I'm doing all of it. But that's not the point, right? It's not the material end of any of this stuff. The, the value that comes from it is the activity is like being in it. And when I think too far ahead, I lose my sense of presence and the meaning that comes from the present moment. 
and yeah, so I, I agree with you. Reading these these guys and and uh, women like help me at least, and it sounds like you as well to like really make an intentional focus to remain present and not justify in terms of what isn't, but to try to justify what is and to do so by like what comes directly next. Yeah, the movie, uh, the Pixar movie Soul comes to mind when we're talking about this of like, you know, the the piano guy, the main guy, like, you know, he's seeking that day of finally performing with the, the band. Um, and then when that day comes, he's like, I, you know, I just expected it to be, you know, more. He's like, what what's next? And they're like, tomorrow we get up and we do it all again. And yeah, it's like, you know, the meaning of life is in the, and then they like have the flashbacks of like the, the first bite of the, the pizza and the, you know, hopping on the subway and the guy's saying, and it's like in the moment, it's like, it, and he was totally closed off to all those things the entire time. Cause all he was thinking about was that day that's going to come and all his problems are going to be fixed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Spencer. I just, I was thinking as you all were discussing this, that how very, um, much like it's like the thinking of indigenous religions they're very circular they're not linear and i wondered if any of these um philosophers studied you know eastern religion or or indigenous religious thought before they started writing um so i don't know uh with any fact but uh I do know that um, like early Chinese philosophy was studied at the time. Um, Simone Vey from our reading group talks about um, Confucius and the Taoists uh, and the like Buddhist Dhammapada and uh, the Hindu Upanishads were like huge minds of inspiration for uh, Schopenhauer. And Schopenhauer is another one of these like kind of grandfathers to existentialism. Uh, I'm talking about like embrace the suck. Um, Schopenhauer is the king of embrace the suck. Uh, and so those influences are certainly present. I mean, like even Hume was like majorly inspired by um, Eastern thought. But with respect to like native philosophy, so like the, the philosophy of um, Native Americans and like the Lakota tribe has like a really rich and interesting um, uh, philosophical tradition, I doubt that that was present in Europe at the time. I mean, it was like, I doubt it was really much present in the uh, American minds of the day. It, it wasn't it written wasn't, down. Yeah. Yeah. And it wasn't really until the Civil War um, that, you, that a lot of that stuff starts to get translated into common culture and you know this is only like 56 like it's like a generation or two after civil war um and so and, and i mean like even now it's, it, it's the our access to these um systems of thought are pretty sparse and the people who study them are very few and far between um so university of oklahoma where i did my undergrad just hired somebody who um his whole career is on um, Native American philosophy. It's really interesting stuff. Um, but yeah, I doubt that that had much, if any, of an influence, but I, I'm almost certain that some forms of um, early Chinese and, and Eastern, like Indian thinking, um, would have been uh, like rolling around in their minds. Anybody else want to share before we close up? Yeah, Shane. I debated about if this was a point or not, but I decided it might be because you all can decide. Uh, it's a story of hope and resilience and we're scientists. So they tossed some uh, mice in the tube of cold water and they let the mice drown and the uh, mice last 15 minutes. And then they got a second set of mice and they put it in the water. And then after like 14 minutes and 50 seconds, they pulled the mice out and saved them. And then after a day or some time to recuperate, the mice back in the water and the mice swam for like 60 hours, don't quote me on times, but it was much longer. 
And uh, I thought about it and it made me think uh, maybe the utility of hope. So I'm counter, uh, I'm, I'm refuting myself maybe, but uh, how hope can be useful in committing philosophical suicide can maybe be nice in our life and sometimes um, get us to better places. I don't have a conclusion there, but maybe toss it out. Did, did they drown after 60 hours? Yeah, of <laughs> I'm just thinking about how they kill a bunch of flies. <laughs> Well, I think that is an enigmatic and interesting note upon which to end our time together. Um, so before we do completely because I want to thank all of you guys. I mean, like I said, this is my last class, maybe forever as a professor. I, again, I hope not, but um, I feel really grateful to have had all of you as students and um, it's been a privilege. I've been super humbled by all of you. Uh, it's like the best class I've ever taught. So thank you. Um, and uh, yeah, until next time. What was the last experiment called? Oh,